Good morning, Acts chapter 8, part 10. Acts 8, part 10, I believe. Open your Bibles to Acts 8. We'll get going. We'll get reading through here. I did want to talk to you kind of a little bit about the uh, YouTube channel just briefly. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not, but we do have a YouTube channel. We have probably close to 200 sermons on there at this point in time. You know, we're putting three up a week and sometimes a little more if I do something in between or if I'm just sitting there and I'll record a little thing or, or here and there. So uh, this past month, you know, we kind of look at the demographics and the analytics and see where we're getting views from and see where we're getting stuff. We had 642 video views. So, I mean, that's, that's quite a bit. Now, we're not advertising this besides inside the, the services, and we're getting quite a few views. And, you know, really encouraging this week, we had two uh, people post on one of our videos and talk about it and say, you know, hey, we don't have any churches in our area, and we're really excited to have you guys posting this stuff. Keep it up, and, you know, your labor is not in vain. That, that was just very encouraging. So I appreciate those guys listening, and we'll continue to provide the messages as we can. We get about nine to ten subscribers a month. Those are just people randomly from you know who knows where. Uh, we try to do what, what we end up doing is we take the messages and we post them as video responses to other videos. So for example, if there's a, a, a sermon on Calvinism, we would take a, one of our sermons a, against Calvinism and post it as a video response. So it's nice because it allows you know a little bit of dialogue and communication to go back and forth. But that's also how we can you know get the truth out there a little better. So we got people really from all over the world listening to stuff. I mean it's absolutely crazy. If you, if I showed you the demographics, I will bring them. I was going to print them out. I didn't have a chance to, but I'll print out the demographics. I'll leave them on the back table, and you can see. And we're not just getting like one or two views from random. I mean, we're getting, you can see the length of time people are listening to these things from, you know, from, from Ethiopia, from Sudan, from, you know, South America. I mean, we have people listening from everywhere, and there, we, you can see exactly how long they listen for, too, you know. So if they click on a link and they listen for five minutes, we can tell that. We can tell if they listen for 30 minutes, etc. So it's really cool to see. We like the comments. Commenters. We like the messages going. And it's one of those things that if you have a drive to go on, and this is what I do, I just go pull up a random one and I listen to it. You know, because what, what are you going to listen to on the radio, really? I mean, think about it. What are you going to listen to on the radio? So you might pull up Christian radio. Who knows what you're going to listen to? If you're not going to be super discerning, you know, you're going to have a problem. So with these things, you know what you're going to get is, is doctrinally correct. You know the truth that's going to be there, and you can listen to it and pop it in. And, and I do it all the time. Sometimes I just put my phone on speaker and I leave it, or I can hook up to my Bluetooth. Or I, I mean, I do it all the time. And you'll be surprised. If you have a 30-minute commute or even a 45-minute drive or something, one of those sermons, you'll be, you'll be locked in, and you'll get there, and you'll be like, oh, I don't want to stop. You know, I, because when, when you're driving, there's really little, there's little distraction for you. You know, you're driving, you're looking straight on, and you're just going. And it's, and it's helpful. So I encourage you guys to listen to those. I mean, you can go back through. We have some that we've uh, uh, taken and put them into playlists now. Uh, Jose had mentioned that. We've been doing that. You know, the playlists are really nice, too. So what it means is that you can just click the one, and it will start playing through the rest of them. So if you have a real long drive, you don't even have to, you know, pay attention. Just hit the playlist. I want to listen to, you know, the evangelism training course all six weeks. Click, and it's going to give you probably close to seven or eight hours of evangelism training right there. Just, you know, you're going to get the whole thing. It's going to play right through. So next time you're on a vacation, you know, have fun listening to it. So I just want to encourage you guys to go to it. It's, it's, uh, it's youtube.com forward slash Suncoast Bible FL. We also are working on the new website. I want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. We're going to suncoastbible.org and suncoastbible.com. They're just going to forward to the same place. So right now we're, we're in the mix of redoing that. We're going to also try to do a podcast. I'm going to try to take the MP3s and put them up either on iTunes or something because I have a lot of people asking for that. I've had several say, hey, do you have a podcast? Because there's guys who use what's called RSS and really simple syndication to podcast things over kind of technical stuff but this is really how our generation of people communicate you know it's it's just going to be very helpful so we're also going to do a blog with that and this is the way we can have a, a larger impact on a greater number of people uh, throughout the world not just in this little area here and we can stimulate a lot of dialogue, dialogue and go from there. So uh, there's also been, you know, a lot of news lately about the Pope. I'm sure many of you guys have seen that. Uh, you know what I thought was really interesting and, and Again, Mike, my, my confession, I listen to NPR from time to time, and I, I was really surprised at how much uh, airtime this whole Pope thing got on NPR. Of all stations, you know, NPR, probably the most, uh, you know, anti-God, anti, you know, uh, um, type of religion, very, you know, against most things, but they'll, they'll put this thing about the Pope on there because... It's like, oh, this is, this is really what we're going to see as Christianity. This is how mostly uh, the, the, those in, in that camp see Christianity. They, they think about it as being Catholics. And so I, I noticed that. And there's the amount of, I mean, I was listening the other day, and they had like 
play-by-play -play going. Oh, there's smoke coming out of the, the, the chimney here now. And I'm going like, what, what is even going on now? Why is NPR talking about this? NPR never talks about this. You know, you get NPR stuff all the time that's just out, 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 you know, out, out in uh, left field. But, you know, I just thought about it. And I, I was listening, and, and one of the guys that I follow, his blog is the Ex-Catholics for Christ. And his, uh, if you guys have never seen his blog, it's pretty good. He's got, he posts at least once a week or so and he's got a YouTube channel and he's pretty good. It's kind of cool because he goes out into, he lives in, he lives in England so he goes out into the countryside into like his uh, farm area and he's got the rolling hills behind it. There's cows out there and he just gets up, he puts his camera up front and he just talks to you in the field. It's so cool because there's, you know, it's all the field behind him and he just goes through and does just an expository. Sometimes it's 30 minutes, sometimes it's two hours. You never know how long he's going to go but it's usually very beneficial and as soon as he talks about current events and he talks about how that relates to the Catholic Church and he's always trying to help the Catholics come out and he gets a lot of persecution. He does a lot of street preaching out there, and he, he doesn't. They don't have they don't have a whole lot of churches to go to. So his church is really a home church that he's got set up and established with himself, his father, and some other guys. So uh, it just you know all that stuff is really good. And I just I just ask myself, man, how crazy to see how much news there. Is. I mean, really, if you looked at Fox, you look at CNN, everybody's talking about this Pope deal, is it not? Does it not seem like everybody is just discussing this at length? And this gives you the prime opportunity to do what? You know, as I said, you know, if you're, if you're prepared, seizing opportunities by being prepared. So today we're going to see a man seize opportunities by being prepared, and you too can seize opportunities if you're prepared to talk about that subject matter. And if you're prepared to suffer some persecution when you go and do that. Because it's inevitable. When, when you go out and you're going to preach the word of God to somebody, eh, just be prepared that somebody might get upset that you, quote unquote, stepped on their toes. And you're really not doing that if you do it in the right spirit. We're going to look at today about how if you use the scripture, not only the memorization, but the familiarization with scripture, how that can be helpful in your encounters on a day-to-day -day basis. So people always ask, well, how do you get, you know, Jason, how do you get talking to somebody about, uh, about God's word? How do you get talk? Well, you know what? It's constant, especially when we have these news things going on. You know, the Pope, man, have you seen all the news about the Pope? Everybody's going to be like, Nobody's going to say, no, I've not seen anything about the news about the Pope. That's, this is brand new. No, they're going to say, yeah, of course I've seen the Pope. And like, just ask them the question, what do you think about that? What, what are your thoughts on that? And they may go like, I don't know, like, why is it such a big deal? Why is everybody really pushing it up there? And it's becoming like the next big thing. I mean, this guy, just because he's a Pope, you know, and, and, and he's going to be the next thing. And what, do you, and what do you know about the Pope? And you might be surprised at what people, what people say and, and, and the, the communication and dialogue that can develop into a good conversation in which you have the, uh, you know, the, the ability to preach to them and talk to them about God's word and the potential for somebody maybe to get saved. It's pretty easy. I think that we, we oftentimes just, we, we push those under the rug as these opportunities to talk to people because why? Oh, we got so much other things going on. Eh, what do we really want to get involved in this right now? What if this guy says something? And we're going to see today that most likely, I think that people, the response that you'll see is better than you'd expect. For the most part, it's better than you'd expect. Most people aren't going to beat you up, especially if they're your friends. If you have a business relationship with them, if you have a friendly relationship with them, you'd be surprised that most people aren't going to just, you know, raise up a fist and pop you one. They're going to maybe put their eyebrows down, cross their arms, and lean back a little bit. But I don't think they're going to jump down your throat. They're going to hear you out. And so in that, I think we can see an example of this today in Acts chapter number 8 with a man, Philip, who was prepared. He was a guy who had some scripture understanding. He had some scripture memorized, and we'll look at that in just a minute. So let's, let's uh, open in a word of prayer, and we'll begin in Acts chapter number 8, verse 30. Dear God, again, we thank you for the opportunity to, to preach to teach your word, to go through and study the scriptures, Lord. It's a very exciting thing to do so, Lord. It is a privilege. It is an honor to do so. And as we go through and see what your word says about this particular topic here and, and this, uh, this, this uh, 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 account of this Ethiopian eunuch and Philip the evangelist, Lord, help us to, uh, to look deeper at what the text really says and what's going on here from a historical standpoint, Lord, and then also from a dispensational standpoint so that we may better understand the scriptures, how they're laid out, how they're framed, and ultimately your plan for the ages. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter number 8, verse 30. We'll just go ahead and read 30 through 40. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and, and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. 
and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, uh, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or, or, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest, with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they were come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Really cool story here. Lots to, to, to digest and go through. But the first thing we're going to see there in verse number 30 is we see, what? Philip hearing something. He hears him reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, how does he know what the prophet Isaiah is? Well, obviously, he's familiar with that text, is he not? He has to say, hey, I know, what, I know what the prophet Isaiah says. I've heard that. So, like, if somebody quotes to you John 3.16, you'd be like, hey, I know that. That's John 3.16. But if somebody quotes you something from, you know, 2 Thessalonians, you might go, I don't know where that is, right? So it pays to be prepared to not only have Scripture memorized, but also it pays for you to have Scripture familiarization. I'm not saying you have to have a, a, okay, a detailed understanding of what happens in, in Ezekiel 4. You know? No, no, no. But generally speaking, you should understand just a little bit about what's going on there or, or what these passages are about. Even if it's just the basic disp dispensational understanding that it's times past, right? So that may be the familiarization that you have. You don't have to get super detailed, but that alone may help clear up so many issues that you're going to have with these people you're having discussion with. So Philip, obviously, he's got some scripture memorized. He knows what's going on. He's heard this before. And so he hears him read the prophet Isaiah, and he knows, hey, I know that. That's, that's Isaiah. And he knew that to be a scripture of that particular prophet. And if you think about Philip, and his preaching ministry that he's had in Samaria, and his, his uh, being chosen there back in, 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 in Acts chapter number 6, in regards to him being full of the Holy Ghost, he's got some other understanding uh, about this scripture, because he's been taught and instructed about who Jesus is. That is, that Jesus is the Christ. But if you think about this also, if, you, if he's also given instruction as one different than the eunuch is one that is now removed from Judaism and the eunuch is still involved in Judaism. You follow me? So the eunuch, obviously he was, he was coming back down from Jerusalem for the worship. He was, as we discussed last week, a proselyte. And now we see Philip, who's not a proselyte. He's now a believer. And we see him, the eunuch, one deeply entrenched in religion, ask a, a very kind of you know, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Philip asks a simple question to the one that's deeply entrenched in religion. And the question is one that I think that if you do it in the right spirit, you know, you ask, understandest thou what thou readest, I, I really think that people will be responsive to that. Nothing really gets people more angry and more upset than when you tell them that they don't know something, right? So you don't want to jump down the throat and say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. You ask a question. Do you understand what's going on there? Just the simple question of that as opposed to, you idiot, you don't even know what that text says. That's not going to be received well. People, you know, you've got you to know how you ought to answer every man, right? And your, your speech needs to be, you know, seasoned with grace always. But the question that we ask is the same one that Philip asked, and we should need to ask many in Christianity that today, and many, many involved in Catholicism. I don't, I don't consider Catholicism Christianity, FYI. I don't, I don't consider that. So when somebody says, oh, that's Christianity. No, I'm sorry, I don't consider Catholicism at all Christianity. 
I, I think that you, in order to be Christianity, you at least have to come from some form of the, the Protestant background, but even then, you have to believe the gospel, and that's the only way you can really be a Christian. Well, he, this, this issue here, you know, it's one that I think we should continue to ask people. Ask those who are involved in religion. Ask those who claim to be, you know, for Christ or, or, or following Christ or, or claiming to know God or speaking for God. And it's ask, you know, do you, do you understand? Do you, do you understand what you're reading? See, Philip's mind, his mind wasn't like the eunuch's. The eunuch's mind was fuzzy. It was, it was blinded by Satan. It was blinded by religion. He couldn't see what really was going on there. So he's sitting there reading the Bible. Sure, is it doing him any good? Is it profiting him? No. Don't many do that too? They sit there and they read the Bible all day long, but it doesn't give them any profit. It doesn't really benefit them in any way, shape, or form. You know, there's a book that I, I, I saw some time past. It was like Jesus Talks or something like that. It's a little book about this big. It's a daily devotional. And it, it's, it's a really weird book. Really weird book. You open it up and it says, listen, listen, Jesus is talking. Listen, listen, Jesus is talking. And then it will quote you like one verse out of context. And then you're like, did you listen to what Jesus said today? How can you apply this in your life? And that's like, that's like the end of the thing every day. And it's really short, but every verse, it's you know, two or three verses in there, and it's just kind of like a little blurb about something. Well, that's not going to really profit you anything. Again, as we talk all the time, it's just con context of what's happening. So what is Philip really going to provide for this man? He's going to provide this man with the context, is he not? Is the guy reading? Is the eunuch reading? Yes. Is he reading words? Yeah. Does he know what those words are saying? Yes. But does he understand what's being discussed? Not really. See, Philip's mind wasn't foggy like that eunuch. He understood that Jesus was the Christ. And using this knowledge, he's then able to do what? He's able to say, hey, I, I know the meaning behind the text, and I can provide that to others also. The question, understandest thou what thou readest? This wasn't something that P Philip was being mean in. You know? Is he being mean? Of course not. He wants to help the guy out. He hears him reading it. He probably gets excited. He's like, oh, cool. I'm going to go talk to this guy about, yeah, this is good. This is, this is all I've been doing anything lately. I've been so excited about, you know, he, he, Jesus. So I'm going to go up and go talk to the guy. You know, and it's, it's commonly understood this, that, that once you learn how to read, what, what age do you start reading? What, like maybe first grade, you know, K, you know kindergarten, maybe you really you, you start to read, and then first grade you're reading a little bit more. And then by about what? Yeah, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's the, about, about what? Maybe sixth grade, seventh grade. you got a pretty good understanding of reading. And then the Bible, the King James, I believe it's written about an eighth grade reading level, overall average. So, you know, most people, most people make it to eighth grade, do they not? I'd say so. So, you know, you can read stuff by doing what? Understanding the mechanics of spelling, grammar punctuation. We understand what that stuff is, but there's, there's a difference. When you can get the sentence structure, but do you know what the sentence really says? I was reviewing some contracts this week, and while I was looking at them, you know, I, I understood all the words that were being stated in there. I'm going through, I'm reading it out, I'm getting the words, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, how do I really know those words? What do I really, how do I know what that's, I mean, I know that anybody could read the word. They could read telecommunications, right? You can read it, can't you? Telecommunications. But what does that really mean? You know what I mean? How about integrated access circuit? You're like, I can read those words. Can anybody read integrated? Yep, I can spell it out. I know phonetically how it sounds. I know how to put the words together, sentence structure, the syllables. But do you know what it means? And that's kind of what Philip's going to do with this guy. And it's very similar to what Jesus Christ himself did, as we'll look in just a second. But I had to have some knowledge prior to this to help me understand the real context of what it was saying. So with that said, anybody can read just about anything. People read the scriptures all the times, and I feel like it's our duty again to ask people that simple question. I think some might say, hey, that's arrogant of you. That's condescending to question whether or not somebody understands something. No, it's really not. Because if somebody didn't do it to me, Frank, for example... If he didn't do it to me, how many you know, years ago now, about three or four years ago, four years ago, I think, and say, you understand what you're reading there? And I'm a kind of, uh, I'm a little bit, I, I can be prideful. I think everybody can. And so I remember I was like, I didn't really get mad about it. I just kind of was like, I don't know. I'm not going to, obviously, he knows something I don't know, so I don't want to look like the idiot and say, yeah, I know. And then he's like, well, tell me. 
I really don't know, so then I'm a liar too, as opposed to just being prideful. So I don't want to be that too. But I think that if you see the response of the Ethiopian eunuch, you'll find that this person and most people, they're, they're usually honestly looking for answers. They really are. It's like people get involved in religion. They're trying to find an answer to some type of question. Somebody died. Somebody had some health problem. Whatever it might be, they're trying to find an answer. And I think you'll find that most people are honest. They are. They really will sit down. And when you, when you start questioning, say, do you understand what, what's really going on? No, I got no idea. I was driving down uh, uh, a two-lane road just the other day, and the traffic was really bad. I mean, it was, like, horrible. And so we're just, this, this line of traffic is just stopped this way. We're creeping a little bit faster than everybody else, but, you know, we're only going five, six miles an hour. And all I, and this is about 6 o'clock, you know, so everybody's leaving from work. And I just look at every single person, and they're just like a zombie staring out the window like this, you know? And there's, that, there's a song by, I think his name is Brandon Heath, and it says, uh, you know, all those people going somewhere, why have I never cared? And I was like, man, this is give me your eyes for just one moment. Give me your eyes so I can see. And I'm looking at it, I'm going like, man, that, that was a good song because it really brought back the, the idea and understanding that I'm looking at all these guys' eyes, and I'm going like, do they know where they're really going? I mean, they're going home, but they look like everybody's lost. They're all just like, their eyes are just glazed over. You know, they just, they got, they, they fell into the system with the man, and the man went all day and just whoosh, whoosh, and whipped them down. And they're tired, and what are they going to do when they get home? They'll go sit in front of the telly. Just knock it out. Oh, I ain't got no time to read. Reading is strenuous. Studying is stressful. Much study is wearing to the flesh, is it not? I mean, it is. But, you know, this response the eunuch says is one that I think you can, most of you guys can relate and say, hey, this is what the typical religious person would do. When you say, hey, you understand us what thou readest? Look, look what the response is in verse number 31. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? I can't understand things on my own. That's not what religion has taught me. Religion has taught me I need somebody else. I need to be instructed in this way. In Judaism, they constantly look for men for affirmations of fact. They look for men for teaching, for learning. And that was in typical line with the Jews' religion. From Nicodemus, who was a teacher, looking to Jesus as a teacher, to the rich young ruler who calls Jesus Christ good master or good teacher, to Paul taught at the feet of Gamaliel, the understanding of the Jew could be likened to many in Christianity today. And that is what? I can't understand anything on my own. Why? Because what they forget is that, you know, this Bible is something that a lot of people didn't have. You know, uh, Philip, he had a copy of the scriptures. He had a copy of the prophet Isaiah. But he didn't have the book of Romans. We do. He didn't have the book of Galatians. He didn't have the awesome book that is Ephesians. He didn't have those texts. So we're going to look today that there are some issues in relation to the, the spiritual understanding and teaching and I think if you look at the, the beginning of the book of Acts, what, what does really Jesus Christ say? In the very beginning there, where through Luke, he says, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. I mean, he did a lot of things, but he also taught a lot of things because the people were in desperate need of a teacher. And the eunuch is a great example of it. So let's, let's dive into this a little bit bigger and, and get a little deeper into this. Jesus' teaching was contrary to the teaching of that day. So he claimed that he was truth, and they claimed that they were truth, but when they're at odds and they're opposite, only one can be the actual to truth. And as we studied through the acts of the, you know, the, of the Holy Spirit and the apostles and their work, they were commanded not to do what? They were commanded not to teach in the name of of Jesus. So what Philip's doing is something that, you know, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders, they didn't want him to do because it was the religious, religious elite's job in that day to do the teaching. You're not to be a teacher. We're the teachers. How can I accept some man should guide me? Well, we're that man, not you. You're a lay folk. You can't understand these things. But in reality, we understood from some of the passages that we studied the last couple weeks, like Mark chapter number 7, verse 7, that they do what? that they teach in vain. And how do they do that? We'll read what it says in 7 verse 7. It says, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So their teaching didn't do any profit because, again, it was not of God. So that response 
that he says there, how can I except some man should guide me? I want to make it very clear that men can do guiding very well. If, and the conditioner is, that men have to have the Holy Spirit. And they have to get that Holy Spirit by one way and one way only. And that's by believing in the death the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe that and you trust in that exclusively for your justification, your salvation, you have the Holy Spirit. It is given to you freely as a gift, as the seal of the righteousness that you now possess. So number two, you have to be taught in the Word. So I think a lot of people can meet the Holy Spirit aspect of it. A lot of people are saved. A lot of men, a lot of pastors... But are they taught in the Word? How does that really work? Well, you have to understand the, the grace of God today. You have to understand His dispensation of grace, understand Paul's apostleship, understand the revelation of the mystery, and then, and only then, can you be a good and profitable teacher of the Word. I mean, if you look at Ephesians chapter number 4, does he not say there that, that, the, that the men are helpers there? They're, they're helpers to do what? To perfect the saints, to edify the saints, to bring about maturity in the believers? Sure. But those are individuals who possess those qualifications that I just laid out. But what's going to be interesting is that Philip, he doesn't have any of that understanding. Think about that a second. There's no Apostle Paul. There's no dispensation of grace. There's no revelation of the mystery. We'll see today that what Philip is preaching is simply an exposition of the scriptures of the prophets, which does not contain the revelation of the mystery. Very clear. He is taught by the apostles. He's been continuing the apostles' doctrine, but he's also taught by the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is a little bit of a more supernatural teaching that he has, and we've seen this in other passages, like with Stephen He's instructed, like back in Matthew chapter number 10, they say, hey, don't even worry about what you're going to speak. For that, in that same hour, the Holy Ghost will teach you what you need to speak. And the same thing goes with Stephen. He's out there, and he, he didn't prepare that sermon. And Peter's other ones, we've gone through that at length. In John 14, verse number 26, you can read that passage with me. It says, the Comforter, which is, again, the Holy Ghost, it defines it for you in an explanatory uh, bracket there. 14, verse number 26, he says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. See, what's important is that this understanding is what Jesus Christ had taught to them. He wanted it to be brought into remembrance, for that's what they were supposed to go do in Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 20. Remember, he says to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach, well, he taught. And then he says, well, maybe you're not going to remember all these things. So what I'm going to do is I'll provide the Holy Spirit who is an instructor and who is a guide. How does that really work? Well, there's a great verse in 1 John that does not conflict with Ephesians chapter 4. That Ephesians chapter number 4 is the Again, the, the, the use of, uh, of, of the apostles and the pastors and the teachers and the prophets and so forth, they're helpful. They help bring about maturity. But how does John really say this? And, and what does this really mean? Well, look at the passage. Verse 26 of 1 John chapter 2. There's a, there is a problem that John sees with man-teachers. And he says that there are some, look what he says in verse 26, these things have I written unto you concerning them that do what? That seduce you. So seduction is what? Looks really good. They want to bring you in. Let me seduce you into this thing. Yeah, that looked really good. I, I want to go for that. Kind of like the Galatians and the legalism problem that they had. They got seduced. Kind of like the Corinthians and their carnality that they got seduced into saying that was okay, that stuff's all fine. Look what, look what is stated here in verse 27. He says, But the anointing which ye have received of him, that's obviously talking about the Holy Spirit, he says, abideth in you, and look what it says, and ye need not that any man teach you. 
But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Well, you know, there are so many people that use this passage and they'll flat out say, we don't go to church. Church is a doctrine of the devil. And I'm like, oh my goodness. It's not. What are you doing with that passage? Why do you do that? Why do you try to take that and, and make it? You've got to remember that before the completion of the scriptures, right, we had prophets. Did we not? Yes. We had issues that we did, that, that because Paul couldn't be at all places, at all times, and everywhere, any, any given moment, we had to have other men. Well, hold on a second. Isn't that being taught by another man? Well, I, I guess. But it's really taught by the Spirit. Well, yeah, what I'm doing today in an exposition of the scriptures is you should hopefully look at the word of God, not really what I say, but look at the word of God and get the context. And then really that's, that's looking at spiritual things. And if you possess the Holy Spirit, you'll then be able to understand these things. You know, what Philip is going to do, he's not going to teach you in Acts chapter 8 about the mystery. He's not going to say, hey, this is the dispensation of the grace of God. He's not going to say, hey, we're now equals, you and I. We're in the body of Christ together. He's not going to say any of those things. And I'm going to make it very clear today that he's going to preach Jesus Christ in a very particular way. Look what he says here. Verse number... Look at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Philip is simply affirming what he has been taught. That is, Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy that is found in a prophetical book, the largest of which in the Old Testament is the book of Isaiah. So Philip takes the prophetic book of Isaiah and is going to explain prophetically Jesus as being the fulfillment of the Christ. So in Luke chapter 24, verse number 44 and 45, Jesus speaks and says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you. He's speaking to the apostles. He says, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So what's he talking about in particular? He's talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection, the things that are written in the law, the prophets, and Psalms, they must take place. They must be fulfilled. And verse number 45 is very similar to what the Ethiopian uh, eunuch receives from Philip. It's understanding. He says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. It's not that they didn't have a copy of the scriptures. And the question is, everybody says, is, well, I don't understand this. If they had these scriptures, why didn't they understand them? You know why they didn't understand them? It's very clear. And it's actually found in the same exact passage, in the same exact chapter. Look at verse number 25. It's an issue of belief. They didn't believe it. They had it. They didn't believe it. Look what it says in verse number 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What's the problem? Was it there for him? Of course it's there. The dude's got it in his hands. We just saw it. He's got a copy of the scriptures. A copy, mind you. A copy. Philip didn't go up to him like, hey man, what, what do you got there? You got the NASB? Oh, it's, the, it's the NIV? Well, we don't touch that one. Who wrote that one? Did Gamaliel touch that one? It's like the Schofield of the day. You know, oh, that's the Gamaliel copy? Yeah, give me that. I like that one. I can find that. Turn a page. No, no, he didn't do that. You follow me? Like he had a copy of these things, just like Jesus does in Luke chapter number 4, and he gets a copy of the book of Isaiah, opens up the scroll, and doesn't go, oh, this one's broken. Somebody give me another one. This one doesn't have what I was looking for. Because if you go back as far as Psalm chapter 12, you can read through there. He preserves his word. He's going to have it. He's not going to let you go. If faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Who's got the word of God? Does anybody have it? I possess it today. It's sitting right here in the pulpit. That right there is a statement you will scarcely hear. Agreed? Amen. Scarcely hear that statement. So in the same way that Philip opens and Jesus Christ does it with the apostles, you, you see it. So, so what does confuse people is this, that scriptures of the prophets speak expressly of Jesus Christ dying. And in particular, they discuss Jesus Christ dying for sins. And that confuses people because they go, well, I thought Jesus Christ, I thought, I thought that's, that's, that's part of the mystery. Well, no. Jesus Christ dying 
It's not part of the mystery. That's found specifically in the prophetical books. But there's a portion of that that is different. And we'll see how that's revealed. Look at again, verse number 31. We'll, we'll, we'll get right into that in just a second in Acts 53, when we, or in uh, Isaiah 53. Go back to Acts 8. Verse number 31. And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? Well, the good thing is, is he picked a good man to guide him. Philip, a man full of the Holy Ghost, understands what's going on. And he says this, and he desired Philip that would do come up and sit with him. So his response wasn't, get away from me. I know what I'm reading here. I'm from Candace the Queen. I look at all my treasure I got in here. He's like, no, dude, I'm lost. Somebody want to help me with this? Oh, you're going to help me with this? Great. I mean, he understood it to be the prophet Isaiah, so he's like, well, hopefully you got some understanding. I think we should take a lesson from this, that many involved in religion, as I said, are sincerely looking for truth. They're looking for answers. That's why they get involved in religion. And when someone comes to them with answers, the reception of that person is usually better than you think. I'll give you an example. One of the, probably the craziest examples I've ever had, I was in a doctor's office one day. I'm sitting there, and the one girl says, hey, don't you have a Bible study? I was like, yeah. I was like, uh-oh, like, where's this going to go, you know? And she says, yeah, uh, this girl was asking about it. And I said, oh, yeah, really? She goes, yeah, you need to talk to my son. He hates Christians or something like that. I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, oh, it's, it's convenient. He's coming in right now. I'm like, really? Yeah, he's coming in for an appointment. He's going to check up. I was like, all right. Oh, you, you'd like him. He, he, didn't, didn't you say you used to like WWF? I'm like, uh, yeah, when I was like 10. And she's like, oh, he got this. He's, he's an old WWF wrestler. I was like, oh, okay. Dude, this guy walks in. He's like 7'4". You know, weighs like 450 pounds. Looks like Goliath. I'm like, David, we're here spinning around the circle. I'm like, oh, man, this is not, not going to be good. So he comes in. We start talking a little bit. And he's very much antagonistic, argumentative, ready to just fire off. And he starts quoting a couple of verses. So that's actually not what the verse says. The verse actually says this. And I quoted it to him. Oh, that's actually not what that verse says either. And, and you know, that text, you're, and all of a sudden you could tell he, he got kind of, uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know, he knew enough verses to kind of play the game with most people. And that's where scripture memorization and scripture familiarization come into play and your effectiveness at defending the gospel. When Paul says he's set for the defense of the gospel, he's set for it. He knows what it is and he knows what it isn't. And so if somebody comes in and starts saying something, he goes, uh-uh, that's not right. So same thing I did with this guy. And he was big. He was scary, I'm telling you. He may not have been 7'4", he was at least... 6'6". Six, six. I mean, he was massive. I forget what his name was. It wasn't Undertaker, but it was something like, you know, he's a big wrestler. I mean, you, you know, if you, I told you the name, I wish I could remember the guy's name. Um, it was one of those things, like the Grave Digger. Oh, I don't remember uh, the, the guy's name. Grave Digger, that's, that's the, uh, that's the uh, race car, the, uh, what is it? Monster Truck, Monster Truck. Yeah, he's not, I mean, he was a monster truck, but, you know, he was the size of one. Uh, anyways, the guy, so, we, you know, we ended up talking for about an hour, hour and a half. And uh, it was really actually a very beneficial conversation. And he was like, oh, I just don't hear people talk like you talk. You know, you don't, you know, I'm like, well, I think it's because we talk like we believe it. And that's kind of how, you know, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 4, where he says, you know, we believe, therefore we speak. And it's like, yeah, if, if you believe it, you know, you're going to speak about it. You know, you're going to really hammer it home and you're not going to be, like, well, it, this is cool if you want to accept this. It, it, you know, the, the typical politically correct thing, the typical thing where I don't want to make this truth for you if it's not really truth for you. Your own truth is whatever you desire. That's fooey nonsense. That, you, can't, you can't reconcile that in the scriptures. It doesn't work. But this guy was actually, you know, he was raised in a somewhat religious home, and he kind of became an agnostic because of his religious upbringing. And he was actually really, really interested in listening. He said, I want to have another conversation, you know, one day. And that's kind of, I actually gave him, I had some tracks in the car, I gave him a track, say, hey, why don't you read that, you know, and go through it. And I asked him if he had a Bible, he said he did. I asked him if he had a King James, he said he did. And so he said, oh, I'll go look through some of this stuff. This is, this is maybe a little bit interesting. And this is a guy, he tells me, he's like, I've, I've made my millions, you know, and I blew it all on Coke. And I was like, yep, you know, how many people do that? A ton. And I, you know, I go back and I, I feel like I, I repeat myself at some points, but it's so true that people need to hear it. Money is not going to give you any type of happiness whatsoever. It's just not going to give you happiness. You know, you can be as successful as you possibly can be, and at the end of the day, you still got the, the six-foot hole you're staring at. Well, what am I doing about that? You're going there. What's going to happen? So and what happens in Acts chapter number 8, verse 32, is very important. They didn't get into a heated argument. They didn't be like, well, I think I say this or this. Or this. No, the eunuch kind of recognized his position as being one of, 
you know, little understanding, and Philip is being a guy who's going to say, hey, I know what's going on in that scripture. I've been taught in this one, and let me explain it to you. So they, they, what do they do? They get together and say, let us reason about uh, philosophy. No. They go and take a copy of the scriptures, and they open it up, and they sit down and they read it. All encounters you have with men must include the scripture. If you do not use the scripture, you're trying to do it in your own power, and it's not going to be as effective. I promise you that. When I was, had many conversations with people, and the more verses you go through people, the more they are interested in what you're saying because it's not what you're saying. They're like, that's not really you. Where did that come from? That's, that sounds strange. And their eyes and their head, and they, it's again, it's that thoughts and intentions of the hearts really kind of get into the meat of the issue. And I think you'll, you'll notice it to be uh, uh, taking you out of the, out of the place of the, of the conversation. You're actually not even there. It removes you from the conversation. You're no longer having the discussion. You're just giving them God's word. And you kind of become that vessel as a throughput so that person meets God face to face with the scripture. So this eunuch, again, he's got this, this copy of the word. And he opens to Isaiah chapter number 53. And we know that the mystery is not found in Isaiah 53. So go there to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse number 7, is where he starts. If you want to hold, go ahead and hold your place in Isaiah 53 and, and hold your place in Acts 8, and we'll, we'll kind of flip between the two. So, starting in verse number 7, he says, he was oppressed. So, let's, let's go through this thing here and ask ourselves a question. Was Jesus correct in what he said in Luke chapter 24? Was he correct that what the scriptures of the prophets said about his death and his, his uh, you know, burial and resurrection, did they take place? Must it have taken place? Was it fulfilled? And let's ask the first question. Was he oppressed? Well, yes, the Jews oppressed him. They use their power and authority to, to belittle him, to make him, you know, to, to be a liar, to make him to be unjust, to make him not to be the son of God. So I think it's very clear that he was oppressed. Was he afflicted? Well, of course he was afflicted. Did they not beat him? Did they not mock him? Did they not crucify him? Did they not spit upon him? I would say that's affliction, would you not? He says, yet he opened not his mouth. Did he open his mouth? Did Jesus say, you know what? I can't wait till I come back and just give you the beat down. Every single one of you guys, you just wait. Or did he say, you know what, I'm, I'm actually not interested in doing this right now. I'm just going to kill you all right now because I'd be completely just in doing so. No, he didn't do that either. And he did it because he had a purpose in his death. And if you read back in Mark 14, verse 60, you read that and you see it. And I'm so glad and thankful that he did this because this right here, again, is not only fulfillment of prophecy in Mark 14, verse 60, but what it also does is it demonstrates that he loved us in the sense that he knew what he had to do. And so we'll see in a second how that really works in the grand scheme of things in just a minute. 14 verse 60, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? Are you not going to try to, you know, p prove your point? You know, like Paul says, Brethren, hear my defense. Jesus doesn't give his defense. No need. We know what's going to happen. Verse 61, but he held his peace and answered nothing. And again, the high priest asked him and said, Art thou the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the Blessed? And then he gives that great response there. So it's clear, yes, he didn't open up his mouth. Was he brought as a lamb, back to Isaiah 53, verse 7, was he brought as a lamb to the slaughter? Does a lamb really know what's going on? I mean, no, it just goes, just does it. Doesn't open his mouth, doesn't try to kick back, doesn't fight. Shepherd takes him, says, this is what we're going to go do. Takes him to slaughter. Obedient. Doesn't put up a fight. And Jesus does it because he knows what has to take place. Not his will, but thine will. God's will. Look at verse, uh, again, verse 7. And as a sheep before a shear is dumb, so openeth not, so he openeth not his mouth. We saw that. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Was he not taken from prison? Was he not put in prison? Yes. He was numbered with those transgressors. 
Look what he says in verse 8, and who shall declare his generation? You know, it's an interesting statement. You know, if he's dead silent, if he doesn't say anything, well, who's going to declare his generation? Who's going to tell what he was there to do? What's the purpose of all these things? How, how was that going to take place? Well, who's going to speak on his behalf? Who's going to tell the world? Well, ultimately, you and I, but ultimately, Philip, too, is he not? Is not Philip going to declare his generation and say, hey, this scripture of the prophet, I can tell you what's going on here. This is what took place here. This was, this was Jesus. He was the Christ. And you read there that he was cut off out of the land of the living. I wish I could just spend a whole sermon talking about that, but I don't want time. That's a great, that's a statement that's used a ton of times in scripture. And he says, and he does it for what? Look at this statement. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. This is what you have to understand. Okay? This is what's going to, some people have a hard time with this. I don't have a hard time. I think it's pretty clear. But let's kind of break it down here for a second. The question is, who are my people? He says that. He says that, that he's broken down for, 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 for my people. It's transgression for my people was he stricken. Look at verse number 4. He says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Okay, who's the hour? Well, look what it says. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They thought what they were doing was God's work. Did they not? Did they not the Jews think that what they were doing in killing Christ was, hey, whoever killeth you, do with God's service? Yes. Verse number 5, he says, But he was wounded for whose transgressions? Our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So you have to ask yourself a question. Who's the hour? Who's the we? Verse number 6 helps you with that. Look what he says. All we like sheep have gone astray. Let's take you to Matthew 10 right now. Let's, let's look at that passage in Matthew 10. All we like sheep have gone astray. You know, I could take you to so many places in Scripture that the nation of Israel is referred to as sheep. And in particular, the reason why they're referred to as sheep is because, you know, they, they, they needed a shepherd. And the shepherds that they had weren't doing their job, as you can go through and look at some of the passages and, and, and YouTube videos that we did on the sheep without a shepherd. But look at Matthew 10 and also go to Matthew chapter number 1. Tell me if this doesn't go hand in hand. Hold your place in Isaiah 53, go to Matthew 1, and go to Matthew 10. Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 21. And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay, so the question is again, who is, or who are, his people? Well, I think it's pretty easy if you just go over to chapter 2, verse number 6. And he says, And thou Bethlehem and the land of Judah are not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people every nation of the earth. No. Shall rule my people Israel. Turn to Exodus chapter number 3, verse 10. Exodus 3, verse 10. Ask yourself a question. Do you believe the word of God? I do. This isn't hard. We'll, go, we'll get through this. A couple more minutes. Exodus 3, verse 10, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, all the nations of the earth. Nope. Bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. You can go through and you can study out where he uses the word my people over and over and over again. Well, look at Matthew chapter number 10. Let's look at about who these people are. Remember where he says that, that all we like sheep have gone astray? Well, here we go. They're astray. They're what? They're scattered. They're dispersed. What's the, what's the problem with them? They're lost. Matthew 10, verse number 5. Then Jesus, then tw the 12, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not hard. I think we can make a determination about who Isaiah is talking about there. Sheep who have turned aside. And just like Jesus, who was filled with compassion when he saw these sheep, he saw, you know, he's like, Ugh, you know, you have no shepherd. You may say, I don't believe this. This seems really confusing. I thought Jesus died for the sins of the world. Oh, he did. Well, how does that work? Well, go back to Isaiah 53 again. Isaiah 53, verse number 12. Look what he says here. 
Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bear the sins of the world? He bear the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, Isaiah must be wrong. Well, no, let's go ask Jesus. Jesus, hey, how, how many, who, who did you die for? Jesus, let's ask him. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 24. He's discussing his death. He's discussing it here at the, at the Lord's Supper, at the last Passover. And he says here in verse number 24, And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. You know, you can look at other passages like John 17, and for lack of time, we won't go there. But just look at John 17, just go through that passage as well. So what you have to understand, though, is that God progressively reveals things. People might say, hey, no, no, that's not right. Now we're his people. We're, we're his people. All the Gentiles were his people. Really? Let's, go, let's ask Paul that. Paul, what's going on there? Romans 15, please. Ask the questions. You'll get answers. <laughs> Romans 15, verse number 8. So, Paul, what was going on? Who, who, who are the people? He says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Verse 10. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with what? His people. If you think that God is done with the nation of Israel too, I wouldn't even want to be you at the judgment seat of Christ. Because that's going to be really bad. This guy's like, what are you talking about? How's that going to work? It's not going to work. Verse 11, he says, And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, look at this. this is, what does Isaiah say? Isaiah proves the issue that they didn't really, they didn't really have a clear understanding about this whole dying for the sins of the world thing. But they did understand that Jesus Christ was going to be someone that who should trust in. Look what he says in verse number 12. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, that's talking about Jesus Christ, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles do what? They shall trust him. I'm going to show you that that's exactly what takes place in Acts chapter number 8. Look at this. Go back to Acts 8 for me. Acts chapter 8. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before a shear, so opening not his mouth. And his humiliation and his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Oh, that makes sense. I kind of get what's going on. Now, verse 36, you can see that they've been probably talking for a little longer because they went on their way. Then, what happens? They came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, Say, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? See, Philip's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's no, there's no doubt in my mind that's what he's doing, because if you go back to Acts chapter number uh, 8, verse number 12, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. See, there's a difference between the Samari Samaritans. We discussed the Samaritans, and then they are actually of, you know, Israel. Whereas this eunuch, he's not. So look at the answer that, that is, is done here in verse number uh, 36. He asks the question. Now, all the passages, most of the modern translations of the Bible remove verse number 37. Okay? They remove verse 37 from the scripture. But it's very telling as to, as to as the, as the context. And what I think is really crazy is they leave verse 36, which asks the question, but it doesn't give you the answer. That doesn't make any sense to me. And if you actually study out why they did that, it didn't happen until you know, a couple centuries ago. They just decided to start doing this thing. Oh, we're going to remove it because it's not in the best manuscripts. Well, what do you mean? It was in the older manuscripts. Yeah, but we got new ones, and those aren't the good ones. Okay, now I'm really confused. What do you mean? You know, it, it gives you the context. It lends itself to make the explanation. Verse 36, he asks, see here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, in order for you to have any part or lot in this issue, your heart needs to be right. Just like he talked about with Simon. He says, your heart's not right in this matter. And look at this, verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what's he going to ask him if he believes? 
Well, I think from his testimony, from what he states here, he believes one thing in particular the name of Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. Look what he says. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This testimony is right in line with many people. I mean, it's right in line with what Peter said. And we can, we can go through what Peter says in Matthew 16, 16. But for lack of time, just give me two minutes, we'll close. What Peter says in Matthew 16, 16 what Martha says in John 11, verse 27, why the whole entire uh, reason why the book of John was written, and then John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. So then you ask yourself a simple question. Is it enough to simply believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God today, and have eternal life? I will tell you no. You cannot believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and, and have eternal life. You can't. Not as it happened today. Was there a period in time in which that did take place? Yep, absolutely. What must you have now you must understand the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins. That's what you're trusting in. Christ crucified for what? For your righteousness. I want to go more, but I want to just give you a couple. Let me give, you, give me 60 seconds to just give you the, the, the breakdown here, the 60-second breakdown. So God has a plan. He progressively reveals that plan, and he does so when he wishes and when he desires. So you ask Paul the question, hey, Paul, how many people did Jesus die for? Well, why does Paul say in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 6, he says this. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 6, he says, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now look at the next part of the verse. See, if you just left it there, you might say, that's kind of contradicting. No, to be testified in due time. Do you understand what that means? That there's a time in which God says, hey, now it's a testification as to the efficacy of that cross. Now we kind of get the bigger picture. Like Titus chapter 1 where he says, in due times he manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. You kind of see how this is going, how it's kind of working out. Again, this is in agreement with verses like Romans chapter number 5, verses 18 and 19. You know, I was reading that one the other day, and I go, well, how does that really work? It says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. I said, well, I thought all, all had sinned. And then I, I kind of clicked, and I said, oh, Jesus Christ wasn't the sinner. So he's not part of the many. You follow me? So I was like, oh, that makes a little bit more sense. But look what he says. And he says, uh, and, and, uh, and so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Those are the people who believe. It's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, nobody can be saved outside of the blood of Christ. So how does that really work? I, I, I want to spend some more time on this. I think we need to, to, to break it down a little bit further and give you some more understanding. So again, you just ask yourself a simple question. Can you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God today, and have eternal life? No. Can't. So do people preach that all day long? Yeah. He that believeth on the Son hath life. Well, the book of John is great to show you the issue of what? Eternal security? Absolutely. The issue of faith alone? Absolutely. But it doesn't demonstrate to you the gospel, the grace of God to a Gentile. So when we continue to go through here, I think next week we're going to show again that this, wa this water baptism that he went through, uh, I'll, I'll kinda, I want to provide some of the stuff that Calvin says on this. Oh my goodness, it's so funny. It's just hilarious. This guy just, he wants to, he wants to baptize people left and right. But it's just pretty interesting to see what they say. But uh, in addition, we'll show you that, that he did not go to heaven when he was, you know, when he was translated, just like uh, Elijah didn't go. You know, people think, oh, you get translated, you go to heaven. And we'll, we'll demonstrate that that's, that's, that's nonsense as well. So this is not making a mountain out of a molehill. This isn't trying to make a big deal out of nothing. This is very important. Because if you go there and you go, well, what's really happening here? What's, what's the issue? Well, it's, it's a difference to how Jesus Christ is preached in accordance to the revelation of the mystery. And so when you see the revelation of the mystery, and I, I think part of the mystery concludes that, hey, it's going to be testified in due time that he gave himself a ransom for all. You follow me? So you're like, hey, in due time, Paul's going to tell you, look, he died for everybody. And you'll see that John eventually gets this in the book of 1 John because he goes, hey, he died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world. Now, that's, that's written way after. You don't think these guys had Paul's epistles too? Of course they did. You don't think that they started to understand things as things went on? Yes, that's why you can read things that Peter talks about, things that are, are written in the book of Hebrews. And you go, okay, they had these other epistles, and everything's kind of making a connection here. So let's just understand today that the gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that believing just simply that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
that's part of the gospel of the kingdom message. I mean, that's really what, that's the crux of the issue. Of course, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Because if we didn't, his death would not have been efficacious enough for us. So it's what? It's, a, it's just compounding. It's just adding a little bit more to the message of the gospel. It's believing in the specific issue of the blood of Christ shed for our sins. You know, he was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. All right, let's close in prayer.